Welcome to Sustainability Now, an exploration of technologies and paradigms to shape a world that works. Designed for socially conscious entrepreneurs and individuals interested in responsible stewardship of the planet. Sustainability Now covers food, energy, housing, water, waste, health, economics, and consciousness. Welcome to your community, Sustainability Now, with your host, Mira Rubin. Welcome, everybody, to Sustainability Now, Technologies and Paradigms to Shape a World that Works. I'm Mira Rubin, your host, and I'm delighted to introduce Christo Miliotis. And Christo is a, a man of many, many talents and skills and interests, and uh, he's also known as Composticus acidophilus, otherwise known as the worm whisperer, eco-entrepreneur, soil alchemist from down under, and he has spent years researching, writing, workshopping, and lecturing in the regenerative agriculture space for 16 years now with a big focus on carbon sequestration and biodynamic farming. And Christo, thank you so much for being here. We're at 12 hours time difference, I believe. And um, so we're spanning the continents and it's wonderful to have you here. Thank you. Well, thanks for having me. If I could just say thank you for that extraordinary introduction. I don't know who you're talking about, but really I started in a very humble way weeding in a biodynamic market garden. And we, in 1971, we were the first to supply organic food at market price into the Sydney market. And that really was my university or my universe that, that really taught me so much. Well, and you were way ahead of the curve, 1971. Well, actually, Rudolf Stein, who uh, brought about biodynamics in 1924, was way ahead of the curve. He's really the the father of of, of, of organics, and we we kind of, uh, without being elitist, we say that biodynamics is the premium organics, and that's measured by the best French wines now are biodynamic wines. Most of the the best winemakers are going to biodynamics, not organics. Biodynamics. Wow! Wow! Well, um, it's all part of an evolution, hopefully, right? Uh, well, we're yeah. really ex- what I'm really excited about talking with you today is to discuss your, your wealth of knowledge around microbes, from fermenting to creating uh, hydrogen gas to creating soil supplements and everything in between. And uh, we haven't really had an opportunity before to speak with somebody with such a broad range of knowledge around microbes and our, the magic of microbes, which is where we get the title for this session yeah. together. Yeah, well, thank you. I'm actually in the process of putting a film crew together for a documentary called The Universe Beneath Our Feet. And the title comes from the extraordinary statement by Leonardo da Vinci, no other, to say we know more about the movement of the heavenly bodies than what is underfoot. And it's so true. In fact, when I was at Sydney University, um, my supervisor was an astrophysicist. And I asked him, why is an astrophysicist working with uh, sustainable agriculture, we called it? Mm. And he said, the mathematical formulas and the technology that's being applied to understand the universal laws of the universe can be now redirected to understanding this extraordinary communities of microbial life. And I emphasize the word life. Uh, Biodynamics means bio life and dynamics, the rhythms of life. That's what we're working with, the rhythms of life. And you need that life context, sorry, for the microbes to thrive. So we're creating a context for life processes to unfold and regenerate so the microbes can multiply. Well, you know, it's interesting. We're gaining awareness slowly but surely about the importance of 
our internal microbiome in our gut and the importance that that holds for our health. And, and concurrently, we're becoming more aware of the microbes that are in the soil and how they contribute to soil health. And yeah. I, I, it's, it's a wonderful thing to ha be able to speak with somebody that can actually bridge those two universes and in, in a specific way that helps people understand the multitude of life forms that yeah. our lives depend upon. Absolutely. One other monkey I can use is a soil doctor. The soil is dying. We know that. And all talking about this, the, the gut microbiome, we, uh, we must honor, you know, Hippocrates, all diseases begin in the gut. So, so we, we, we're starting to elaborate that in terms of Alzheimer's, multiple sclerosis, autism. We know it's related to the gut, at least 90% of them are. So the tragedy of today's agriculture is that we're basically carpet bombing the soil with the antibiotic called Roundup. Right, right. We're killing the very metabolism of the soil to regenerate the soil, to create fertility, nutrient density, cycle nutrients, improve water structure, water holding capacity, and so on. So we're, we're, we're doing everything against the, the laws of nature which have been developed over eons. We're going contrary to all that. And reductionistic science is partly to blame because we're breaking it down to atoms in a in a in a you know in a newtonian mechanistic worldview which well, even even beyond that it's really driven by uh the, the the mechanistic aspect is driven by a an impulse to create more to produce yeah. more to create a, a greater productivity and and the result is that we destroy the source of the productivity because we're not honoring the the yeah. laws that yeah. That generate it. I'd like to refer to the more. I talk about the more on principle. You know, the more you put on, the better. And it's interesting. It's quite uh, an example. I did a workshop, a two day workshop with the farmers doing regenerative agriculture, uh, uh, doing what we call natural sequence farming, where the water goes laterally in the subterranean soil by slowing up the river so it breaks down its incisive power, eroding power. And he was getting grass in the worst drought we've had. Wow. And the farmer next door said, oh, he's got green grass. I'm going to have to put on more fertilizer. And he was bringing in feed $8,000 a week, losing money. And, and, and destroying the soil. And the farmer who spent $12,000 in 2005 no fertilizer and raising fat lambs and cattle yeah, and green grass. Well, so let's talk about solutions because you've actually developed some wonderful, wonderful uh, technology or um, products actually that supplement the soil really, really effectively. Yes. Yes, absolutely. I'm uh, in my sites, I'm hoping that Roundup will be banned, but unless we find alternatives, there's no point in banning something. So one of my, I'll go into what you've asked me. Yeah, but, I, well, I just to your point, actually, you have developed something that has a much better result. And one of the best pathways to change is to create a more, beneficial alternative which is something Absolutely. that you've done and then people can choose not to use roundup because there's a better solution absolutely and what i do rather than killing the microbes in the soil i've developed product uh, two products over three years one is called agent green uh, and agent green is essentially both a fertilizer and a weed killer based on natural substances which are organically allowed imports so you're not damaging the soil, but you're fertilizing the soil. The second one is called Bee Friendly, where it is both a foliar or leaf fertilizer and organic pesticide, which works very well. Now, essentially, for farmers to transition from chemical farming to regenerative farming, there's three things they need to address. One, nutrition. 
because they're not using fertilizers or synthetic fertilizers to the pest pressure because when you use uh, fertilizers and your soil's weak, then you attract pests. That's what the job of the pests are to get rid of the weak plants. And thirdly, you get weed pressure because it's, the weeds are trying to regenerate the soil in their own way. So by having these two products, you address those three issues and then you follow up with the 500 identified species of micros we add to the soil, which will build the soil again and the fertility cycles. I have to ask a question because I, I understand that when plants are unhealthy, that's when we have pest problems. That's when we have weeds, weed encroachment. When we use pesticides and insecticides, um, weed killers, doesn't that compromise the plants? Absolutely. I, I say uh, pests are not the problem. Pesticides are the problem. Don't shoot the messenger. Read and listen to what the message is. Uh, there was a wonderful biodynamic farmer who was a, a biochemist, PhD biochemist, and he approached the, uh, he worked with the agriculture department post World War II, uh, and he tried to say, don't use chemical fertilizers, and he wasn't getting anywhere, like stone deaf. So he bought land in Canada in 1969, 400 acres for 400 Canadian dollars, and it was so not fit for agriculture. He got the record crops, which surpassed the best soil in Canada, twofold, potatoes, barley, etc. So essentially with biodynamics and compost and cover crops, 30 different species. He made this profound statement that when you put out the fertilizer, you got to go back to the shed and get out the pesticide can simply because now we know that we change the nutritional profile of the plant. We force feed the plant. It becomes an excess in its nutrient uh, nitrogen and the wrong kind of nitrogen that then emits a frequency, which insects have the capacity to see and they go for those plants a week because their job is to stop them regenerating. Interesting. To take so them out. So how did you, you, you started off by saying that you developed a weed killer and you developed a pesticide, and I'm wanting to understand how is that safe? Well, uh, basically, um, when I say a, a herbicide or weed killer, uh, essentially you can use um, systemic weed killers. What we're doing is we're using a, a desiccant. So every weed has a, a waxy cuticle, right? So we, the, that protects it from the outside world. Now, what I use is a particular uh, nutrient, actually, which is uh, it's, uh, in small portion is a food additive. It's a loud food additive, and it's an allowed organic input. I use that at a, at, at a concentration which breaks down the waxy layer. Then with the fertilizer, it's got a lot of um, concentrated nutrients which further dry out the weed and we're fertilizing at the same time. So, so how do, I have to ask you, how do weeds know they're weeds? How do we know that your, your weed killer is killing just the things that we don't want? Because you spray it on the things, you, the weeds only. You don't spray on the plants. Well, how do you do that? I mean, well, you just you can you, you got you can do rigs where you've got sprays in between the rows, or you've got there's many ways you can uh, make equipment which targets only the weed and not the crop. Or the best way to do it is you plant a diverse uh, species, thirty species cover crop, then you spray with the weed killer. It's organic. Those weeds then lie down. Then you. S so into that, you direct drill into that, and you've got a, a weed cover, a weed, an organic weed cover, and then you follow up with the, the microbes. And so uh, the That's same, the same with the insecticide. So there are there are many insects that are beneficial, right? And yeah, that well, that's true. Uh, usually, you've got again. A lack of balance. Uh, we have a thing called a stink bug, which has got a very hard exoskeleton. Now, that um, 
that's again a reflection of, of soil uh, poor nutrient profile. And one of the ways of treating it, I asked a very, very good uh, farmer who's had many third generation organic farmer. He grew citrus plants. And of course, the stink bug attacks the, the uh, citrus, the new leaf growth. And uh, I said, John, what do you do? He said, well, what I do is tons per acre. And the next year, there's no stink bug. So again, the, it's nature's way of trying to take out things that you, which are unhealthy. But um, because normally you have a proliferation of one species, pest, it's a very good question, thank you. You haven't got the beneficials yet. You haven't got the conditions for the beneficials. So basically you're taking out the, um, the excessive population usually of one species and then you regenerate the soil, then you'll get diverse diversity of, of insects which balance themselves out, both predators and uh, the so-called insects. Um, I, I believe you have, let's see, I'm just looking at a list of the different things that you've created here. One of the things that you talked about is the, the dangers of fertilizer, and yet you have created an organic and liquid fertilizer, yes? Yeah, yeah. Well, the organic fertilizer is embedded with 500 different species of microbe. We know that microbes are like bank tellers. They hold on a lot of the nutrients and they only give you a little bit back. It's your money, but the currency they're dealing with is the nutrients the plant needs. It's an incredible symbiosis where the plant will actually select the microbes that it needs and feed those microbes specifically. It's, it's gorgeous wisdom that we're just totally bypassing. So when you say that this formulation has 500 of uh, microbes, how did you come up with that even? Like what, okay, what's well, the foundation? Well, when I say thank you, but it wasn't me. It was uh, Rudolf Steiner and then subsequent practitioners that work with Steiner's indications. So there's nothing original in that sense that we did. But my colleague is a professor of uh, microbiology in China, and he identified every species that you know right down to the genus the family etc so don't write down the species so he identified 500 species that that should be in the soil that are no, in the soil a small microbial uh, formula and and i'm guessing I, i'm wanting to understand how do we know that that's optimal you know because what we're playing with like you said it's a very delicate well, well, balance well, well, because uh, we know the functionality of not all of the 500, but we know the functionality. For instance, one of them is Bacillus subtilis, and we talked about Roundup. Bacillus subtilis is one of my favourites. Not that you should have a favourite, because they're families. You shouldn't sort of say pour all your love to one of them, but it's one of my favourites. And it makes that wonderful thing called natto. That's why I love doing fermenting foods and, and, and culturing the soil and culturing the food but so we're adding cultures like adding you know a bit of uh, yogurt to make uh, yogurt to make new yogurt in the milk right so the compost we add the compost preparations which is like making yogurt we add the starters and they proliferate and they they mold the whole thing into optimal nutrition um but to answer your question, how do we know it's optimal? Well, I mean, there's infinite number of them. But as I said before, those, there's key. It's like the conductor in the orchestra conducting this whole, uh, you know, the wind section, the, you know, the string section, the percussionists, et cetera. So these microbes are the conductors that are bringing the symphony and creating this incredible sound. But in this case, we don't hear it, <laughs> uh, but it happens. You see it when the plants respond. And, and so how, how do we know it's optimal? How do we know it's optimal? Because the the we grow, we get thirty eight percent more yield. There's no pest attack. There's no uh, diseases, and the key thing is it tastes better and lasts longer because it's got more by fatality. And that taste, that complex taste, is coming from increased nutrient density. So, so our, our tester, 
Our laboratory is our nose, which is 80% of taste, and our tongue. And I said before, the best wines in the world are biodynamic wines. Have, so you, have you actually been able to do nutrient studies on the food that's produced by any chance yet, or is that, that something in the works eventually? Yeah, look, everything in, in research costs money, and unfortunately yeah. there's very little money given to, to organic research. It, I would spend half of my life seeking grants unsuccessfully. What they're looking for is using a reductionistic approach to solve problems that came from reductionistic science rather than looking at more broader things. And I think they've been bought out <laughs> by bigger, bigger force companies. So, you know, I can scratch together small amounts of money. Yes, I did do some research. Talking about more on principle, uh, for many years... I love years, that term. It's brilliant. Yeah, for many years, I did a research and pot trial in a hothouse growing tomatoes, cherry tomatoes. And um, I thought, Gee, I'll, you know, I want to get really good results. Now, normally we only use five grams per hectare to increase the... Of these 500 uh, microbes? No, no, this is, this is a, 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 an atmospheric spray. It, it increases the photosynthesis, increases the activity of the chloroplasts, which are the organelles for making sugars. And we only use five grams per hectare, and we get significant increased yields in protein and sugars and, you know, bricks levels if you're looking at that in carrots or grapes. So I thought, oh, God, you know, I've got to make sure this really has outstanding results. Paradoxically, what happens when you use this uh, spray, which is based on silica, but it goes through a special processing, um, you get bigger tomatoes, tastier tomatoes, denser skin, which protects against pests, increased flavour, increased aroma, increased colour, and thereby increased nutrients. And I will, I will answer your question ultimately, but I like telling stories. I would agree. <laughs> so... So what did I do? I put more on than what, rather than respecting 75 years of, of, of empirical derived practice. Um, and what happened was extraordinary. I got smaller tomatoes, rather than being sweeter, they're bitter, probably medicinal, I should think. And I thought, whoa, Chris, what have you done, you moron? You know, like crazy stuff. But I went to Crete. I did some workshops in my, my motherland. Uh, I'd never been there because I'd only travel when I had a purpose. And, you know, I'm not into the tourists. I mean, of course, you meet people and you taste the food and you tour around. But anyhow, I finally got this gig to do some fermenting food workshops and some uh, uh, compost workshops. And I met this lovely... Um, uh, olive grower in, in Crete. Oh, what a wonderful... Now, Crete is known for making the best olive oil in the world. I mean, they've got Mount Zeus, you know, the gods. I'm sure they bring something to the harvest. So what he did was he used these two preparations. One is the soil preparation, which we call 500, which increases the soil building capacity in the, within the soil. And the other one is, is the 501, which is silica spray. We use 75 grams of the soil spray, 5 grams of the light spray, I'll call it, only twice a year in the growing season. He got the highest levels of phenols ever from a laboratory in Athens. It was so good. It was pharmaceutical grade, and his auntie had arthritic pain in there. He couldn't sleep from pain. He said, rub it on your uh, knees, and lo and behold, the pain went away. This is I olive mean, oil? Olive, yeah, with this olive oil. Uh, yeah, I tasted, tasted some. It had a really amazing peppery aftertaste. It was, you know, it had this incredible flavor. Amazing. And we know the Mediterranean diet, which is predominantly plant-based i mean you basically have more olive oil than you have rice you know you have in, in everything you everything's going to be swimming in olive oil and we know for a fact you know everyone's talking about cholesterol we now know it's this you know so-called good cholesterol bad cholesterol hdl ldl well it's more than that it's the low the small particle ldl that's oxidized that's the problem for heart disease what does olive oil do? It stops the oxidation of the small particle LDL. And I know a lady who does these measurements, the 
large particle and small particle. She drinks the stuff. Drinks and olive she, oil. The skin is amazing. Wow. And, well, and let, let, me, let me bring you back around because you're talking about these products and, and phenomenal results and talking about less is more in yeah. this case. Oh, I love that. Yeah, it's fun. <laughs> so I'm wondering, are these, are, are these products available? How could people... Yeah, look, there, there is a simple thing to do is to uh, Dr. Google. Do you have Google in America? We do, we do. <laughs> right. Well, Dr. Google... Go and just look Biodynamic Association of Australia, of America, and they'll they'll resource you. They'll put you in touch with practitioners. They'll mentor people, etc. Alternatively, there's a Joseph uh, Porter Josephine Porter Institute. Okay. And in fact, the pupil of Rudolf Steiner uh, was Dr. Pfeiffer, a PhD biochemist. And he left America, uh, Germany during the war and he started biodynamics there and was a principal researcher and he developed uh, inoculants for, for, for compost. So Joseph do, you, do you have any particular names of these formulations that people would be able yeah, to look they're into? They're just called biodynamic preps, but you need, to, you need to do some workshops, you need to get some mentoring rather than just giving somebody something without knowing what to do. So it's not just the substances, it's the intent, as we we know, but it's getting the basic know-how from people who have been old hands at it. So okay. the simple thing is Biodynamic Association of America, and they'll direct you. To okay. Them. Now, you've also developed a, a strategy to create hydrogen using yes. microbes. So let's well, talk about that a little bit. We know the most abundant element in the universe is, is hydrogen, and it's speculated that you know that everything's derived from that. I didn't actually do it. My colleague, um, who's a professor of microbiology, I've worked with seven years. He developed it with a team for over th over the three years, trial and error, trial and error. Eventually, isolated two soil microbes, and the the nutrients they need, which is pretty minimal, and basically took uh, some uh, effluent water from a potato pack factory uh, got the starch, potato starch, six grams plus the microbes in a nutrient bath generated 700 mils of hydrogen within 17 hours. And now, just, just so that people have a reference point, other ways that hydrogen is produced in terms of volume and energy supply requirements yeah. and such, can you give some kind of comparison so people have a Yeah, record. of course. Well, uh, yeah, I, I've tried to do that, and it's challenging because there's many different technologies. The, the, probably the front runner is hydrolysis uh, using uh, solar energy uh, or wind energy to split the water atom into hydrogen and oxygen. So um, that's the front runner, but there's also other things where they can, uh, at very high temperatures, they... Uh, they, uh, for instance, you, when you make biochar, they use the syngas and they can get uh, carbon dioxide, hydrogen, methane. Uh, there are many different techniques. And, and the, the critical question is how much does it cost per litre of, or cubic metre of hydrogen? I believe we've probably come the lowest cost. And people say, oh, you need to heat it up to 1,100 degrees. No, we don't. We just use ambient temperature because the microbes do the work. Well, so that's a really big deal because then it's not consuming so much energy to produce it. Yeah, but the title of this talk is really uh, powering up the circular economy with the magic of microbes. So it's not, we not only make hydrogen from microbes, we also, one of the liquid fractions, we make a very powerful fertilizer to, to imagine what that is. Uh, the work was done on a revegetation project on a mining site, barren soil plus. We added out 500 micros plus the liquid from making the hydrogen, and we got 100% growth cover, and the growth was above the knee. In what and it wasn't a of time? Oh, I don't know. It wasn't a leprechaun. No, 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 actually... no, no, no. Like, was it one season, or did it take Yeah, yeah, time? just in the growing season, probably a few months. Wow. But above the knee growth, 100% cover. Another company, which is just adjacent, uh, we used their microbes with irrigation. We didn't have any irrigation. 
got at best 20% cover to above ankle growth. But there's more. Talking about more on, this is more. <laughs> we also, another liquid fraction, because my job is to kind of say, how can we make it even better? So from this suit, we can take another liquid fraction and make an, yet another organic fertilizer, which is approved, uh, right? Now, I said to my colleague, Dong, I said, well, why don't we use hemp? Because we've had catastrophic bushfires as, as you have had, had in your uh, summer season that we now call the bushfire seasons. Um, and we can make hemp, which we know is a great insulator against fire. You can get a blowtorch against a hemp panel and you put your hand behind it, no problem. So we can make, we can take hemp and we're taking the, um, the carbohydrates from the, the hemp to make the hydrogen plus the fertilizer plus the weed killer, but we can use the leaf to make an organic pesticide hmm. as well. But we can take the solid residue because the structural fibres are silica-based and lignin-based and that we're not using to make the hydrogen and we can make fireproof panels and we can add a, a your friend Sean has got a bioresin which actually hardens the, um, the panel so we're not using lime and we get a very strong uh, panel I just want to I want to clarify the reference you made. Um, Sean is Sean Steed of Change Climate, and if you check out the Sustainability Now dot Global website, there is an interview with Sean that's awesome. Sean is revolutionizing yeah. the world through bio epoxy. Yeah, but there's more. So we take the inner core to make the bricks. We take the outer core, and I'm in the process of trying to get funding to use a decorticator because we, we need to separate the outer fibre from the inner core. And there's a Canadian company doing that with AI and all you know sensors and very, very efficient, like generating tons and tons. We can take the outer, outer fibre, combine it with the bioresin and, and make aeroplane panels, car panels, wind, wind turbine panel uh, blades, etc. So, so I, I'm going to stop you again because yes. we we have another interview that I want to reference, and um, that interview is with uh, a fellow named Cam, uh, who has been doing all kinds of remarkable things with hemp and uh, building hemp create homes. And so please check out our uh, website and look for the. The uh, current interview, it was just aired last night, which was, uh, let's see, July, what is today, 16th. It was aired July 16th. So um, if you want to check and learn more about hemp and exactly what Christo's talking about, you'll be able to get some more information there. Absolutely. Well, uh, we, our company is called hemp h for housing e for energy m for microbes and p for profit Perfect. so the future the future generating profit is from hemp uh just importantly we need to also state that if if every farmer grew 10 percent on his land hemp which returns him massive profit and remediates the soil and detoxifies the soil and stabilizes the soil and breaks up the compaction of the soil because the roots can go down two meters. And that would offset, carbon. Yeah, that would offset 64% of our global annual greenhouse or CO2 emissions. Yeah. Plus, we've got a way of building which is fireproof, plus the buildings generally do not need heating or cooling and heating and cooling is expends 30% uh, of our carbon budget per Huge. year. Huge. So let me, let me bring you back around to microbes because we've got some more great things to talk about. Um, you're talking about how we can remediate the soil, how we can deal with pests, how we can deal with weeds, how we can create energy with hydrogen. And let's talk about fermented food and how it, helps to uh, build our health, our gut health. Okay, well, that's a, that's a whole topic in itself. Oh, I know uh, it is. So we're just going to play, and I'm gonna, I am going to ask you about your favorite fermented food. Okay, sure. Uh, well, well 
I used to, when I do, do workshops, I do outdoor culture, which is compost, and then indoor culture. So when you grow your food, your cabbages, let, what do you do with it? besides putting it in the freezer or it rotting away, which, you know, adds to methane gases. So, uh, yes, I've been, I treat three different styles uh, or different processes of fermenting food. My favourite has to be uh, dairy kefir, if you're not dairy intolerant, uh, because it's got 72 plus micros plus synergistic yeast. It makes vitamin K2, which cleans out the artery calcification, deposits in the bone, uh, improves mood. The word kefir in Turkish means feel good. So we know 90% of the serotonin is made from the gut lining cells in the gut. And yet there's a huge industry making serotonin reuptake inhibitors to increase serotonin in the brain. And like take kefir. I'm not telling people who are on antidepressants to do that, but certainly include that and see if you improve and you may with proper medical monitoring come off that. So that's yeah, I, I want to, I can let me just be devil's advocate for a moment here. Uh, we hear a lot about the negative impact of dairy um, and the, the dangers of dairy or the sensitivities or digestive issues around dairy. So how does, um, how does milk kefir work in with that? Okay, well, have you ever milked a cow and had raw milk? I have never milked a cow. Have you ever had raw milk? <laughs> I, and I would venture to guess that most of the people that are listening to us probably have not yet milked a cow. Well, that should be on the bucket list. Beekeeping, <laughs> milking a cow, it's got to be on the bucket list. And making compost. But uh, basically, it's a different, it's a different, it's got enzymes because when the calf has to break down the milk which is incredibly rich it's got all the enzymes preserved with raw milk now i know it's controversial and won't go there that's the first thing the second thing is yeah if you've got hypersensitivity to to milk that's a problem but we know for a fact for instance peanut allergy in your our day people teachers didn't run around with epi pens and everyone you know had to sniff you just had to get a sniff of peanuts and you'd keel over with anaphylactic shock. That didn't happen. Why? Because the microbiome in the gut's destroyed. There was work done at Monash University or was it Melbourne University in Australia. They had kids which had these hypersensitivity reactions under medical supervision. They gave them lactobacillus uh, GG or I think it was GG. Um, and 80% of those kids, they'd then give them peanuts under medical supervision, 80% of those allergies went away. So, yeah, it is one bacterium or probiotic for overcoming that allergy, but it's all about diversity. So when you have a diverse range of probiotics and you inoculate every day because some of them don't attach to the gut lining, et cetera, ex except things like bacillus subtilis, which releases spores, which just proliferates and knocks out candida, et cetera. So... That's, that's the first thing. The second thing is when you let the uh, ferment go for longer than 24 hours, up to 72 plus hours, you're basically breaking down the protein, which is the casein, which is the allergen. Now, I'm not talking about super sensitive people, but that breaks down the allergen, plus it gives the probiotics, which probably stop the allergy process in the first place. So generally what I do, I will do a workshop and I do, you know, kinesiology, muscle testing, and you get the best organic biodynamic milk, unhomogenized, you know, full cream milk, and you test them. You, they put one hand on their tummy, they hold with the other, uh, they hold the, the milk, you know, in a bottle next to their gut, and you test the muscle testing with the other arm, and they're weak. So they've got an, an intolerance, I'll say, not an allergy. You then give them the fermented milk. It, they're stronger. So, so first of all, you said something really important, and that is that it needs to be organic. It needs to be um, humanely raised. You, you want to make sure that you don't have antibiotic-laden, pus-ridden, <laughs> uh, commercially produced milk. But um, 
we I call it kefir. You call it kefir. Um, right. And I used to I used to make you it say here. Tomato, I say tomato, tomato. Exactly. So <laughs> yeah. I just for folks that are unfamiliar, I just want to clarify what it is. It's these little granules. They well, they're bacteria, but these little granules they look a bit like cottage cheese, and you put them in the milk, and they do their thing, and it sours the milk in what I consider a really delicious way. Um, it may be a cultiva cultivated taste, but it also gets thicker and it's, it's like a thinner version of yogurt, but uh, with a lot more beneficial bacteria, correct? Yeah, yeah. To, to, to extend that further, it's, it's one of the scobies, like kombucha, which is scoby. Scoby stands for symbiotic. I love the word symbiotic, right? We're having a symbiotic conversation. <laughs> symbiotic culture... Of bacteria, of bacteria and, and yeast. yeast. Yep. Now, those yeasts make the K2, but those yeasts also knock out the candida, which is occurring because of probiotic, uh, antibiotics in the Roundup, antibiotics in the poultry, antibiotics in the milk, antibiotics in the pork, antibiotics in everything. So, um, And nature abhors a vac vacuum, so you get candida colonising where the... the um, bacteria, protective bacteria were. So kefir is number one. The number two is kimchi. Kimchi. Now we've got a pandemic. I know for a fact, and I followed the research because that's what I mostly do. That's why I've got a big nose. And, <laughs> and so, um, so um, the Koreans, I saw a, a, a small experiment, which wasn't written up in a paper. They had, uh, chooks, which had avian bird flu, 15, they gave them kimchi, 12 of the 15 survived. Mm. Normally it's 100% mortality. So I followed you, up further. Can you give, <laughs> us, give us a bit, for folks that don't know what kimchi is, maybe you can just explain the ferment. What is it? Okay, kimchi is using Chinese cabbage or Napa cabbage, and then you, you, you make a paste with chili, garlic, um, I, I add other things as well, turmeric, of course, and you may, and they use fish sauce or oyster sauce. I don't do that, but uh, I add uh, tamari or miso, things like that. Um, and then you add salt because you need the salt to create the environment to promote the lactobacilli and get rid of the baddies. I put ginger in, uh, etc. I mean. And I go to what do you do? You you layer it with paste? No, with what you do is you get a bowl and you cut the cabbage or you peel the cabbage leaves, you put in water and you add salt and you let that draw out the, uh, the, uh, the, the sugars and you massage it to break down the cells. You leave that stand traditionally for up to 48 hours. I do kimchi in about less than 10 minutes. But there's different ways to do it. So you've prepared the cabbage. It's sort of wilted and flimsy. And then you make a paste. And normally you use gloves and goggles because you don't want to touch your eyes. And you make this, basically, it's a kimchi paste, which is very red, full of, of chili powder. And then you baste it onto the leaves. And then you put shallots and daikon radish and whatever else you like. And you put it in, in a jar. It doesn't need a brine uh, to cover it because it, it, all those antioxidant-rich herbs and spices prevent the mold formation plus the salt. Do you press so it in there? You jam it in there? or you, No, you, don't, you can put it in just a container as long as it's got cover so the outside bugs don't get in. But even if they did, they won't touch it because it's so many strong... Uh, you know, it's not a fluidy thing. It's a pasty thing. And that's it. You leave it and they leave it up to... You know, they can leave it up to 10 years if you like. They used to bury it in an earthenware in the ground uh, for a year. And the longer you leave it, the, the, for instance, the vitamin C level goes up. But if you, then you get another succession or wave of, of microbes because they consume what they can. They run out of, their, out of their specific nutrients. Then you go from vitamin C to ascorbogen, and ascorbogen is a known anti-cancer agent. Huh. It's what you find in broccoli sprouts. So the longer you leave it, the more complex the flavors, the more nutrient value, and the more you know enzymes and, and nutrients there are. So that's my second favorite. But my creme de la creme, I, six years ago, came up with a crazy idea. How can you make one firm that's got every nutrient you need for optimal nutrition? 
and I've just cracked it, and it tastes superb. It's got a beautiful, complex flavor. It's got the umani taste. I don't make it too hot. It's not too salty because the way I culture it, it's the only thing it lacks is sweetness, and I could overcome if I wanted by using licorice powder for kids because kids won't eat it. So basically, got four of the five tastes, but I can do five tastes, and I'm marketing that under the brand name Fire in the Belly. Fire in the Belly, and I'm yeah. guessing that uh, that is in Australia, not available in the U.S. Oh, look, I have made it. Uh, but no, I'm seeking an agent investor. I've just recently contacted a, a company. It's got three nutritional companies, and uh, I've uh, sent uh, a brief on the, to the lead developer. I'm going to send them a sample of my other creme de la creme, which is big fuss, big fuss from beetroot juice. Mm. Uh, but I make it child friendly, and of course, I use other other ways and increase the nutrient profile and the uh, probiotic profile. It tastes amazing. I mean, I know I made it, but it tastes, well, the micros made it, but it tastes amazing. And I believe it's very uh, child friendly. So I'm going to market that. That's going to be called Upbeat. Oh, fun. Oh, I love it. So the the thing that I have experienced with fermenting is um, that, there's a lot of off. There's a there's a lot of gas that's produced, and uh, so oh, there's. Oh, let me show you. Just, just I'll show you. Be, me being me, I thought, how do you make things easier? Because I've done so many workshops, and people say, "Isn't that great?" And they don't do anything with it. Now, this isn't my label. Uh, it's just. Can you see that? Wow, Kehoe's Kitchen Red Kimchi. Yeah, that, that's not me. That's not me. Okay, but probiotic got, fermented vegetables. Yeah, it's got a one-way valve, which you can't see. It's got an aluminium. Now, people can say, oh, no, aluminium. Look, aluminium is so ubiquitous. It's the second most common element in the earth. It doesn't leach. It does The acid, which why I chose that is because, one, it's recyclable, and secondly, I need an acid-resistant uh, thing. Now, I can put that in a jiffy bag. It's got a, a reseal, and I can put that in a jiffy bag, in a postage bag with bubble wrap. I know it's not plastic. I'll find some other alternative, and I can post that to you when I make it. It's easy. And what happens is you don't need any weight. You don't need brine to go above the, the vegetables. Uh, you put in a, a saline solution according but, to what you want. So that's and for the kimchi. Gas comes out. So kimchi is okay, but like sauerkraut, for instance, yeah, or... Well, they've got another one. I won't get it for you, but it's a sauerkraut. So the gas just comes out through a one-way valve. I see. Okay. It's so easy. Okay, I can make it in less than three minutes. I, I, I get a bowl. I, I cut up the cabbage to the dimensions I like, depending on the crunch I want. I add salt to taste. I don't measure, but you can measure precise to make a 25 or 3%, whatever. I... You know, massage it, gives my own skin microbiome. Hopefully it's, it's good. <laughs> yeah, it's <laughs> like that. And, um, and uh, I put it in the bag. Done. Done like a dinner. I mean, it's so easy. Like, it's so easy. And, and, like, I've probably spent three months finding the right ones with all the specifications I need. And I can get one for, you know, that's about 500 grams and I can get a, a litre gram. I mean, coffee bags, it's the same sort of thing. But this one's also got a, an addition. It don't, I don't need it, but it's got an additional, like, filter on top of the, fil- the one-way gas valve, just to be sure. You know when it's spilling out, you know, you know squashed in postage or something. That's it. <laughs> Finished. Wonderful. And I've got a beautiful – sorry, I've got a – for my uh, upbeat uh, drink, for kids, I've got a, um, a silicon, which is great because it's inert. It's a collapsible, reusable water bottle. Oh, that's but it's awesome. rainbow colors because I'm making another series called the Rainbow Drinks, so seven colors of the rainbow. That's my latest thing. And for kids, you know, they love to collect things. So I want the red, I want the orange, I want the yellow. Now they're getting fruit and vegetables without the sugars. So the the, here's a question that I have though about the fermented stuff. Doesn't it keep fermenting? Uh, well, it runs out of its resources, which is usually sugars. And then it, it, they just hibernate because there's no more sugar, uh, carbohydrates for them. So what is when happening in this, stops, in this you know, packaging? Really- like when you're selling stuff that's packaged, um, isn't it still fermenting? And what happens when it runs out of its resources? Well, it doesn't matter because the lactic acid is a natural preservative. 
So it'll just stay and it won't get, it won't turn into vinegar, for instance. No, no. The lactobacilli have created lactic acid. Vinegar is acetic acid. So you're making lactic acid, which is a preservative, like vinegar is a preservative. Of course, it's a, it's a Ziploc bag. So you open it, once you've opened it, you just whack it in the fridge. And if it's still fermenting away, it doesn't matter because it just leaves the gas coming out. Okay. I mean, you might get a sulfurous smell when you open it, but hey, that's, that's, that's kind of neat. <laughs> <You know>, it's, <laughs> <laughs> it's a cultivated taste. So, Christo, this has been such fun. I, I want to ask you, is there anything I should have asked you that I didn't? Well, you know, I can't say enough that we don't understand the universe beneath our feet. We don't understand the complexity of this extraordinary, exquisite, interconnected universe beneath our feet. And we need to pay homage and respect. That's what we live from. And we've lost 70% of our topsoil. We need to respect the land. We need to respect the soil. We need to give, as Ratan Lhasa, one of my soil heroes, said, we need to give soil rights and make it a criminal offence to de degenerate or degrade soil. And until we do that, we're not going to get far, quite frankly. We've gone far, so far down the, the course of heading towards the, the iceberg, we, we can't just rearrange the deck chairs on the Titanic by using more reductionistic science to solve problems coming from reductionism. We need to think holistically. We need to connect with all the faculties we have to sense what this extraordinary mystery and wisdom of natural law is and, and work with nature, not against her. Thank you for that. Thank you. So well, beautifully, beautifully said. Christo, how can people get in touch with you? Well, uh, hopefully I'll be inundated. I will have a signing, autograph signing. I am in the process of resubmitting my manuscript called Grounds, of, Grounds for Hope, which is a three-volume uh, work taken four years from getting up to five to going to bed at night at nine and researching and writing and dreaming. Is it, is it published already? No, it's going back to the second uh, revision to make Wonderful. it more palatable. Uh, to a wider audience because uh, I use a lot of technical stuff to try and justify my arguments. But I've got my mentor is Tom Keneally, which you probably know as a famous uh, Australian writer. He wrote Schindler's List, for instance. Wow. Uh, and many other. I mean, he's a world-renowned and just such a great human being. And he's so enthusiastic. He, this is the plug. He said this book is important as the silent spring. Wow. Wow. And it's still relevant today. So... I, you know, amidst everything else, I'm juggling. Um, I'm, I'm going to finish that and then uh, hopefully, but then, then I'll do autograph signings and I'll send you a but In the meantime, if people want to reach out to you, how might they connect okay, with Okay, growing as in growing plants, growing. B for Bob, D for Dad, which is BD, biodynamics. Growing BD at guess what, gmail.com. Beautiful, beautiful. So, um, do you have any recommendations besides your upcoming book? Do you have any recommendation of books that might be wonderful for people to learn more about microbes and the magic beneath our feet? Well, I think what we didn't speak about was fungi, which are really the nutritional highways. And when we plow the soil, we cut the filament and they communicate with each other. We know the plants talk. If this plant lacks carbon or nitrogen, it sends out a message and they send it. So, uh, uh, Paul Stamet, the, the mycologist who's doing amazing work, is definitely a, a goer and, and learning how to grow mushrooms or get the right uh, uh, fungi to uh, bacterial population in your compost, etc. cetera. Um, not so much uh, about micros, but as, in terms of climate change, uh, Paul Hawkins' work, uh, Drawdown, is great. And there's a whole thing on food which covers the, the different ways in which if we work with the world, uh, the land, we can draw down carbon and stop emitting gases into the atmosphere. So draw down uh, Paul Stamets work. Um, I mean, there's lots of different books. I, there's such a long list. Uh, Charles Massey, who's um, an Australian farmer, wonderful work called the call of the reed warbler. Um, um, in terms of scientists, Ratan Lau, Professor Ratan Lau, R-A-T-T-A-N-L-A-L. -L. Uh, he was recently given the equivalent Nobel Prize for agriculture. Wow. And he, he was the one who said we need to have laws to protect the soil. 
right? And if you break those laws, it's 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 an offence. We need that desperately. Um, but he's a great researcher. I mean, it's a very very long list of of, of course. If you're into uh, a lot of people I know aren't into uh, animal husbandry, but humane animal husbandry, which actually will make a big difference in terms of bringing down carbon and fertilising land, is Alan Savory's work. Yes, uh, is is a must in rotational grading. I mean, the big key thing is agro uh, silvo pasture. Getting the right mix, about thirty percent trees to to pasture, gives you the best uh, carbon sequestration and best conditions for the animals if treated humanely. Um, oh my God! Well, if you're really keen, uh, Rudolf Steiner's agriculture lectures. Actually, but that's it, that's a great question. So, in terms of, for somebody that would like to get a solid introduction to biodynamic farming. Is there a text or is there a book? Well, that that's, the, that's the original course of lectures by Steiner, but it's heavy going. I don't suggest starting with that. And, and really it's a question of a lot of hands-on learning from feedback from nature, connecting with the Biodynamic Association of America. And they have field days, they have online webinars, they have bulletins, they have e-letters, they have journals, etc. Acres, of course, is a great resource. Acres, which is a fantastic institution. Rodale, uh, which you know, uh, done lots of experiments over the years and, and publish as well. Uh, they have a great uh, publishing uh, arm, and as, as does Acres. Beautiful. So go to Acres, join Acres. They'll put bulletins, the latest uh, material. Uh, but it's not only about microbes. So, uh, it's well, no, more, it, but it, yeah. I think that microbes are a wonderful uh, entree into this yeah, whole the way, world. The way I talk about microorganisms, which includes the fungi, is that we've got we've got a breakdown of the systems. I'll finish on this: the solar plant cycle, the carbon cycle, the water cycle, the nutrient cycle, all that fragmentation is brought together by the magic of microbes. They're the common agent which weaves this web of life together again and brings reintegration of landscapes and, and ecosystem functioning. So microbes, meaning not just bacteria, but fungi, and microflora, including earthworms, except dung beetles, is where it's all at. Beautiful. This whole food, food web. That's yeah. a great, great way to end. I want to say thank you. Thank you. Again. Thank you. This Thanks. has been such a treat. And thank you to our producer and my co-founder, Scott Billy, and to all of you who are helping us to build community and make a difference in the world. And that's it for today. I'm your host, Mira Rubin. And until next time, live the life you love. Love the world around you. And together we can save the world. Thank you for listening to Sustainability Now. Visit sustainabilitynow.global to find resources related to today's program. While you're there, pledge your support by making a contribution to help us shape a world that works. And remember to subscribe, share, and follow us on social media.